Bonsoir à tous et, et bienvenue. Given the current geopolitical situation and the tension due to the war in Ukraine, one could think that uh, the subject of this evening is fertile. In reality, beyond the armed conflicts, there is an even greater challenge that globally threatens on Earth, and we all know it. The dramatic deg degradation of our environment confirmed by the most recent IPCC report. But thank God there are glimmers of hope, and one of them may come from the Red Sea corals. Excellencies, Monseigneur, dear special uh, representative for science diplomacy, my friend Alexandre Fazel, dear former federal counselor, Audrey Fuss, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Diplomatic Club, the Geneva Graduate Institute and the APFL, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to this conference entitled Red Sea Corals, when science and diplomacy converge to address climate change and regional stability. Just the title is quite a program. And uh, this event is held uh, as a part of Science Diplomacy Week 2022. While, uh, while uh, coral reefs um, are disappearing around the world, the Red Sea has recently embodied the true hope that at least one large coral ecosystem will survive global warming due to the exceptional resistance of its reefs to the rise of water temperatures. This finding raises questions. How can a regional and inclusive approach to preserve this coral's reef be taken when the Red Sea is at the center of geopolitical struggles involving regional and international actors. Can science diplomacy foster engagement between scientists and policymakers to formulate and implement an environmental protection strategy at the scale of the entire Red Sea? What role can international Geneva, and maybe Switzerland, play in promoting dialogue between the scientific and diplomatic communities. To address these issues, we are fortunate to have among us a panel of experts at the Conference of Science and Diplomacy, and I thank them already uh, on behalf of, our, of the partner for their participation in this panel discussion that will be introduced by uh, our moderator, uh, Akim Venman, later on. Uh, but uh, to set the scene, I will give now the floor to Alexandre Fazel, our science ambassador, the Swiss science ambassador, who will uh, make a short introduction, I guess, and maybe give some answer to my question. Alexandre. Merci, cher Raymond, Monsieur le Président, Madame la Présidente de la Confédération. Um, Monseigneur, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers amis. Um, I'm the special representative for science diplomacy because I'm more of a diplomat than a scientist, so uh, I do not want uh, to act or appear as, as an imposter. But to reply to your questions, the two questions you posed, that is precisely what science diplomacy aims to achieve. In science diplomacy in all its complexity. Because science diplomacy is different things. It can be what I call diplomacy for science. That's when we need traditional diplomacy for science to happen, for scientists to be able to come together and work over the borders. Then you have science for diplomacy. That is when you use science for diplomatic means or diplomatic goals, rather. And then you have science in diplomacy. That's when diplomacy pulls in the resources and the insight and the knowledge and the facts of science into the diplomatic and political debate in order to achieve 
solutions that are solid, fact, and evidence-based. This latter point here is where Geneva is absolutely central in global governance, because Geneva, as we all know, is the engine room of the international system, of the United Nations, and far beyond. So everything what happens in the field is sought, conceptualized, organized, implemented, ev evaluated out, out of here. And so that's the space where we need to bring science on board into our world as diplomats for the benefit of global governance, sustainable development goals, so, and then all the frontier issues that will come after and beyond. And this is especially important because science and technology, which flows out of science, never stops, rather accelerates. And you know this phenomenon of the convergence of all the sciences, bio, nano, neuro, info so, uh, sciences that come together, they open a huge field of academic pursuit and discovery that leads to an acceleration of the technology. We will live through technological revolutions in a quick succession in, in the coming years. And all that will change the face of the earth and fa the, the, the face of humanity when you think of advanced AI, quantum revolution, human augmentation, geoengineering, and the likes. That will change humanity, and hence it will change the way humanity is organized and looked after the common global good. So we need to be aware of that in order to prepare the global governance, and we are doing that as a Swiss government out of Geneva by having created a new foundation, or well, new, three years old now, the Geneva Science and Diplomacy Anticipator, which does precisely that, offer an insight of what is cooking in the labs, what will science and technology offer to the world, so that we can have in time, as an international community, a conversation around the opportunities and the challenges of what is coming so that we can fully exploit the upsides of science and technology while framing the downsides and the threats and the challenges, because they're always there as well. So that is something we do through the action of the JESTA Foundation. And this week, the entire science diplomacy world has congregated in Geneva for the first JESTA Science and Diplomacy Week. And, um, um, and it's, I have participated in some of the sessions. I see that the track on which we are firmly engaged on is the right one, uh, and there is a global buy-in in this approach. Now tonight, the Red Sea corals and the project of the Transnational Red Sea Center. The beauty of that project is that it is in the midst of all the different categories of science diplomacy, as I just explained. Diplomacy for science, science for diplomacy, science in diplomacy. It's a project in its early stage, and we will th live through and possibly discuss all those different aspects, how they unfold in the lifetime of this wonderful a project, which is led by Professor Anders Mebon of the EPFL, who I would like to invite onto the podium to give us, as an introduction before we go to the panel, the les tenants et aboutissants de ce projet. Merci beaucoup de votre présence, Anders, au travail. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much uh, for your presence here tonight. Uh, I'll say some words about the, uh, the Transnational Red Sea Center and uh, what we would like to achieve. And uh, so what, why are we here? It was already hinted to in, in the introductions. I don't think it's a secret to any of you that our ecosystems are under pressure and deterioration on a global scale. In fact, uh, some of them are in free fall and this is true not just on the continents, but it's also very true 
in our oceans today. And um, coral reefs, unfortunately, are perhaps the, I shouldn't say the best, in fact, the worst example perhaps we have on this. This is how a coral reef should look like. Okay. You have beautiful corals, you see the fishes, they are, they are hotspots of biodiversity in our oceans. Okay. They are host to millions of species, and they're not just important from a biodiversity and ocean functioning perspective, they are very much essential to the likelihood of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people, in fact, who are directly depending on the ecosystem services that you can extract or benefit from, from a healthy coral reef. Think seafood, simply the fish stock and fishing. Think income from tourism, which is extremely important in many parts of the world. And maybe perhaps more indirectly, but extremely important too, the, the, the corals are building barriers against the wave action. And they're protecting the shores very efficiently from erosion and inundation. So there is an enormous you know, gain from, from healthy coral reefs. And hundreds of millions of people who live in the tropics and subtropical belts around this planet are benefiting directly from this and are depending on it. The real problem is that most of, in fact, today I can say most of our corals, coral reefs, they look like this. This is from the Great Bear Reef. Uh, and as you know, you, you read the newspapers on, about, the, about the corals. The Great Bear Reef is again hit by a major uh, so-called beaching event. I'll say a few words about that. The corals are dead. And because the corals are at the base of the coral reef ecosystems, when the corals die, the whole system comes tumbling down. There's no fish in this picture, and this is not artificial. There's no fish because the fish stocks are plummeting, and of course, you know, fishery suffers di directly. And so we have a very, very serious situation in our oceans today, and there's really no way to sort of sugarcoat it or, or say it in a nice way. These are the facts. In the last 30 years alone, we lost, and I'm sure today it's more than 50%, <coughs> or what we call the so-called so pre-industrial coral reef cover. So the, 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 the coral reef abundance or cover that we had before, we started messing with the system anthropogenically in a, in a, in a real way. And at the trajectory in which we are today, we're expecting that not more than about 10% of the corals are going to survive even past mid this century. This is tomorrow. So why are they dying? What's happening here? Well, they're dying from a number of reasons. Some of them are local in nature, and some of them are global. Local stress, local poor quality, very bad fishing practices, just physical de destruction of the reef is obviously contributing. But these, these are local phenomena that, in principle, we can manage and mitigate. Okay. Unfortunately, on a global scale, we have a very efficient killer of corals, and it's global warming. Global warming is increasing the water temperatures so fast the corals cannot keep up. And there's more and more frequently, uh, frequent, uh, higher, higher frequency of, of heat waves, which simply stresses these organisms to the point where, leaving all the biological detail out uh, aside, to the point where their metabolism and their physiology is so perturbed that, as a rule of thumb, on a time scale of weeks, maybe a month, depending on the species and the conditions, they die. Okay. And this is what's knocking out enormous swaths of, uh, of, this is a phenomenon called coral bleaching. They turn white in the process. And this is, for example, what is, it, it, today, right now as we speak, is hitting 90% of the Great Barrier Reef. And I remind you that the Great Barrier Reef is the biggest reef structure we have in the, in the planet today. It is a surface area the size of Italy. You can imagine if we on land had a phenomenon that, that wiped out 90% of a surface like Italy, that would be, it would, it would, it would trigger a catastrophic, cat catastrophic response immediately. But this is actually what's happening underwater. Now, in the midst of this reality, there is a hope that has been created. And actually a very significant one. And it's in the Red Sea. Because about five, six years ago, maybe a little longer, seven, eight years ago, we realized and I'm happy to say that our lab at EPFL was part of these early efforts to, to do this, but the real pioneer actually is, is Professor Meros Fein in Israel, who realized uh, that in the, in the Red Sea system and its gulfs, the Gulf of Aqaba, you have one of the ears there, and, and the Gulf of Suez, we have a population of corals that is extremely resistant to the effects of the stress, what we call thermal stress from global warming. And we have quantified this now, and it's absolutely unheard of. Compared to any other coral population that we know in the world, they can tolerate so much heat that just about, no matter what global warming trajectory that we were going to be on towards the end of the century, which will cause many other problems, as we well know, but these corals can take it. Okay. 
So there is a real hope here for humanity, if you want, to preserve a major coral reef ecosystem alive and functioning. Provided, of course, that we don't kill them with local environmental stress sources, local pollution, local, local effects. Okay. So we really have a situation where, on one hand, we know these corals can survive the global warming that is predicted. On the other hand, we're gonna have, if we want to preserve them, we have to protect them from the local stress, the local pollution, which in the Red Sea system, and that's another unique characteristic of the system, is the system is very small. The Red Sea, as far as bodies of waters go, is very small. The Gulf of Aqaba, the Gulf of Suez, they're bathtubs. They're very small. Any, sign, any significant source of pollution will spread within the system, and we know precisely how and when and, and, and how fast, because we know the currents, et cetera, and very quickly and hit basically across the system. Okay. So there is no way we can actually, because of this physical reason, there's no way we can really hope to preserve these corals for future generations to enjoy and benefit if we do not do it on a regional scale. Okay. And so on one hand, we need, what are the ingredients for that? Well, it's science and it's diplomacy. We need the best possible scientific basis to inform the most efficient environmental protection that we can, and we have some very efficient tools for, for, for doing this today. And at the same time, we need the diplomacy to create a high-level governmental dialogue among the governments to make sure that this is happening on a region, regional scale. And now, it's no secret when you look at this map, there's no countries uh, listed here, but you, you probably all know them. It's no secret, I don't think I'm offending anybody if I say that it's a geopolitically complicated region. And so putting that together, what I said before, and that you know, fact was what, the, was what led to motivated the creation of the Transnational Red Sea Center. The idea that in order to help along the process of organizing a regional scale protection of these, of these, uh, of these corals, these, what we call the last reef standing, potentially, we need protect, perhaps a neutral partner and I think Switzerland and is, is a good example of that, which on one hand can help, and I emphasize, help organize the scientific and, and obtain the scientific basis for this protection, which is really the basis for the decision making, and on the other hand can help create the, the diplomatic dialogue to make sure that the things are happening at a, uh, at a regional level. And that was really the idea and the motivation for this Transnational Red Sea Center, which was inaugurated in 2019 by our foreign minister and current president, His Excellency Ignacio, Mr. Ignacio Cassis, and really with this idea of marrying science and diplomacy in an efficient way to try to obtain this goal, which is in everybody's interest, the survival of these Red Sea corals. So let me just say a, a few words about what's under the hood a little bit and what, what are the pillars of this of the center, what we would like to, to put into, on, on the table. But first of all, as I said, we, we are really aiming to help and, I, and, and in direct collaboration, and this is very important to emphasize this, the local, working with the local scientists to, to create the, the scientific basis okay, for, 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 for the protection. So we know the reef, okay, and we know where, the, where we have to prioritize the protection and where perhaps developments can go on uh, untouched. Okay. At the same time, create with the help of our ambassadors in the region and the, uh, and, and the, and the ambassadors here from the region, I'm very pleased that, you, that you're all here, um, to create a dialogue which is ongoing. Our, our ambassadors of the region are doing an absolutely fantastic job, and I'll get back to that a little bit again. And then everything we do, and this is another important aspect, will be done according to the principles of open science. So this means we're putting, there's no secrecy, we're putting all the data on the table, everybody has access to everything. Why? Because it's not just because open science is by nature the best science, it's simply also a question of creating trust. If you want people to talk together, everybody has to be on the same page. Everybody has to have access to the same information. So open science for us is clearly a tool for creating the trust, first of all, between the scientists that are involved in this, but also at the more, at a higher governmental level. Education. A very important aspect of this will be education and training of, of the future scientists, the future park managers, the future rangers, et cetera, and the future people for advocacy. Why? Well, this is a question of time scale. Huh? This is a project and an effort that will take decades 
to, to carry out, that, that it operates on, on, a, on a time scale of decades. It's not a, a question of a couple of years in a study you know, that we can finish within the lifetime of a PhD student. This is a much longer term process that we have to sustain and a, an effort we have to sustain. And so we have to create the capacity for future generations to take over and lift this into the future. And we're talking about decades here. So education and creating capacity, both in the Red Sea region, but certainly also around in uh, other parts of the world, to contribute to this is essential. And finally, we would like to use culture and art as another expression of these, of these, on this theme of, of coral reef conservation and to create a, an, another level of dialogue in another way. Okay. And all of this with the, with the aim to really try to create this regional scale protection of these absolutely unique coral reef ecosystems that we have in the Red Sea. So where are we today? Well, we are, have already started. Uh, in fact, last year we were already, on, we were, in fact, we were, for example, we were in Sudan initiating a scientific work. This summer we are going to start a, a, and do expeditions and, and, and scientific work in Jordan and Israel, and then we'll continue to Djibouti and Sudan. We are also putting in a network of online, what we call autonomous coral health monitoring stations, which are state of the art. We would like to create a network of these. They are giving instant warnings if anything goes wrong with these corals on a, on a, on a very rapid, and this will be unique. Uh, to, to the Red Sea. And just, I'm not going to go into any kind of this, uh, all these scientific details, but I just want to say that we have a lot of, put a lot of thought into defining a number of scientific packages which are intended not just to be cutting edge science for the sake of cutting, of, of doing science, but intended to be, to packages that are intended to be impl 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 implemented everywhere we go on a, to create a, a holistic view of the state of these corals in the Red Sea and their potential for survival in the future. Okay, some of you will recognize some of these scientific terms, some of you will not, it doesn't matter. The point is, these are, these are scientific packages that are intended to get, obtain the information that we really need for efficient uh, reef protection and that the governments need for, for, uh, for efficient reef protection. So, as you can see, we are, we are putting together a, a, a sort of a, a complicated, I would say, but, but, but so far very manageable and, and very interesting, uh, you know, painting a picture that, is, that is, uh, is involving a wide range of partners and, and, and players and supporters. First of all, we have as our main player, uh, main supporter or partner, if you want, the Swiss Foreign Ministry, which is, has been just amazing in its, in its support to this. Uh, I would also like to, to really thank the governments that we are now in more increasingly in, in, in contact with, in fact, some of them on a almost daily basis, uh, the embassies, their missions here, and again, thanks for being here, of, from the Red Sea region. We have a number, I, we were trying to put together the list of, uh, of, uh, of collaborators uh, scientifically. I can't, and it's too long to get, make meaningfully show. It's very long. The regional uh, and, and international conservation organizations that are involved and, and that we collaborate with is also very long. And then, of course, we have a, 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 a private foundations and, uh, and individuals that are supporting us. Now, I would like to say, and now that I'm here, that we don't have enough money. <laughs> now, when I say this, uh, but quite seriously, we have a base funding right now from, and we're very happy about this, from, from, uh, from a foundation, in fact, based here in Geneva, and it makes us operational. But we do not have enough. Now, it's not a question of more, send more money, we always need more money. No, we know exactly what we need for a full program to carry out this vision, okay? So it's not just a question of more money, but we are not there yet, so I can say, okay. <laughs> now, so, in summary, this is a long-term vision for regional scale scientific collaboration and di diplomatic uh, dialogue. It's a question of creating in this process trust. It's a question of, of, of creating in this process training and capacity building, both in the, in the Red Sea region, but certainly also on, on, on outside. Okay? And all of that, of course, with the aim to create this coordinated government action that can, on a regional scale, save these unique Red Sea calls because we cannot allow them to die. Okay. And so I would like to thank the, uh, the Graduate Institute here. I would like to thank the, the, the Club Diplomatique de Genève for, for this event. Really, it's uh, greatly appreciated. It's obviously very successful that what you have done. Uh, and I would like to thank all of you for being here today. And I look forward to, uh, to discussing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anders, for your presentation. Don't, don't walk off, just stay on, please. Um, if you come, yes, please. 
Thank you very much. And also on behalf of the Graduate Institute, a warm welcome to all of you. Um, I am Achim Benemann. I'm the Director for Strategic Partnerships, but I'm also here uh, because I work on conflict, peace and security in the Graduate Institute. And as this is also about regional stability, this is of course a focus we also would like to, to, to get to. Um, perhaps just a few introductory words from, from, uh, from our side. Um, what the hope that has been expressed here in the peace world is of course not unheard of. There are many, many, many cross-border national parks, collaboration around water ecosystems, all sorts of environmental peace-building cooperation that exist that show that such an integrated approach can work. There's an entire association that is dedicated for these type of contacts. Uh, so for all those who think, oh, this is overly ambitious, it can work. It requires the right uh, amount of collaboration and particularly the right amount of groundedness. And this um, is what I want to start the, the, the conversation with, uh, with you, Jana. Uh, you are the Jordanian director of Eco Peace Middle East. And uh, when this is about, this panel is also about regional stability, uh, your day-to-day -day job is a region which is perhaps not characterized by that word stability. Um, so can you give us a sense of grounding about what the ambition uh, of the project entails when you look at it from the ground up. Thank you very much, Achim. And um, it's such an honor to be um, among you all today with um, starting um, such an important project. Um, I come from a region that has never seen stability. Stability, um, caused mainly by the Arab-Israeli conflict, but also now coupled, and everything in between, but coupled with climate, inst climate change and climate instability. Um, so that's the hope that our group, Eco Peace Middle East, brings, is to bring that stability through focusing on such important issues. We are characterized by being um, an environmental peace-building organization, established with that peace, with the hope of the peace process coming to our region, but very focused on working together um, as Israelis, Jordanians, Palestinians. And when we were first established, we had Egypt back then, with a main mission and vision to protect our shared environmental heritage, very focused on touching the transboundary um, shared resources, especially water resources. So we work mainly on what's shared um, uh, 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 between the three countries now, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, the mountain aquifer and the coastal aquifer shared between Israel uh, and Palestine. Um, our methodology as an organization, starting early on by focusing on policy change, and we all know that we need policy in order to get things implemented on ground, was not, on, was not enough on its own. We soon discovered that we needed to engage people on ground. People that are most affected by the um, environmental challenges, by the problems, by the lack of resources. Empowering them with the right amount of information, having them be part of the process so that they can make that difference and put that pressure on the decision makers. So that's a very important part of the process, is bridging that gap between the people that are most affected building constituencies within the communities um, that share that water resource in all three countries, but then having them send that message they need because they're the most affected to the decision makers and it makes all the difference. Of course, it's also, this also needs to be coupled with the science because if you want to change policy, you have to be convincing. So you have to bring that proof to the decision makers with the research, with the data, to empower them to make that change. 
thank you. And and I, I think you you uh, the, you point already the, that you need to have a joint understanding around what in fact the problem is. It's so important to bring people together, even though uh, they might at first say, "Oh, I don't believe you," because not everyone believes in science. Uh, and hence the, the emphasis that you point out and where I think the, the message also coupled with the big messages that come from Geneva, from the ICCC, is this is such a big problem that one has to go beyond all of the other problems. Um, because otherwise there is no reason for, 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 for continued existence and the cost will be very high. So if you, if you think about grounding the approach, uh, where do you see specific entry points for com constituencies? Will it be in the tourist agencies, uh, the tourist associations? Will it be in the port authorities, the diplomatic community here? If, if, we, if we ground it, I'm going to come up, I'm going to go from the ground up, uh, but let's stay perhaps a, uh, a short moment there. So tell you the truth, it's not one party that you need to work with. The way we are functioning as an organization is whenever we see an opportunity, we have to take it. And we have to frame the right messages to the different stakeholders. So for instance, I give an example of working on the Jordan River Basin. We created a campaign. Uh, we had to do, first of all, the research to convince policy. Um, but then we created a campaign for the people on ground. Because people living in those communities, because of the conflict and because of the river being a border area, were never convinced um, that they had any influence on all the degradation of the Jordan River or the diversion of the Jordan River until we worked with them. And they were part of seeing with their own eyes the pollution that's caused from their side. They were only playing the blame game of pointing fingers to the other side. So Jordanians would say, this is uh, all uh, 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 to blame on Israel. They're the ones that are polluting. They're the ones that are diverting. And Palestinians, they had nothing to do with it because they're not full riparians to the river and they're not allowed access, nor do they receive um, their fair uh, share of the river's water. But when we come in and when we bring those people in, different stakeholders, the municipalities of the area, uh, uh, the farmers that make their living on ground, and we work with each on making them understand and become part of the process, they take ownership. So it's important to, to have an inclusive approach. But not only that, you also need to address it from um, uh, different, uh, uh, a different perspective, like the importance of the Jordan River being uh, holy to half of humanity. So we created um, a faith-based campaign, you know, working with the different uh, congregations, and we created a campaign that, um, uh, that really shows the importance of the river and water in Islam, in Judaism, in, in Christianity. And we brought them all together. And that was possible because they found that they, were they had so much in common. And they were able, as congregations, to put that pressure on the decision makers to sign a covenant calling on the rehabilitation of the Jordan River. So ownership in, in the international community is a big word, but it is very and, and living to hear that it, what it in effect means to construct it. And it, it's great to have ECOPIS as an institution that has done it. Uh, involved in this in this project because it is work. It is is it means long 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 years of relationships. It means trust building, and you don't do this in a day. And then I, I perhaps take this ownership aspect as a as a bridge to you, um, Anders. Um, you said lots of the research is done with local research teams, and uh, I think what would be good to know is if you unpack a little bit more what it really means to conduct the research, like in physical things. The, the, you need to organize ships and boats, and it all s sounds still very abstract, at least to me, what it means to do an expedition and to create an evidence base. Yes, so um, it's, yeah, it's, there's a very pragmatic side to this. Uh, you do need a ship, you do need equipment on the ship. Uh, 
if you go to, to the, if you want to test, for example, one of the really important aspects of this uh, work that we want to, stay, to start now is to test the actual thermal, the potential for survival, if you want, the actual thermal resistance of the corals. This is done with, with specific equipment that we bring. Uh, it's done in a very controlled way. It's sort of like taking the corals to the doctor and, and giving them a, you know, a checkup to see how they're going to behave. And this is extremely important information because it's not the same on, uh, across the reef. There's lots of structure in a coral reef, and there are regions that are much more important than others. And this is crucial information for anybody who has to take decisions about, about how to preserve them. So what does it mean in reality? It means you go to, uh, to on a ship, you sail to Sudan in July and August, and I can tell you it's very warm. <laughs> So you very actually it sounds wonderful. Huh? We go to coral reefs and we work and it's uh, pretty, but in fact it's it's brutal work because you're on a ship in uh, I don't know what humidity and what temperature, but it's very warm. Why do we go there? Because we want to test these corals at the peak of the summer when they're actually under the, the, the maximum thermal stress naturally. Okay, so there's no escape from this. We cannot go when it's more you know in January when everybody else goes to see the the fish. So. So there is, there is this practical, you know, actually sort of blood, sweat and tears uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, part of the work. And then there's, of course, there's a, a more paperwork uh, associated with this, but it's completely necessary because we have to follow all the conventions. There are permits that have to be obtained, CITES permits, there's an Goya protocol, etc. And this is all uh, work that goes through the local governments, the local ministries. And here again, of course, our dip diplomacy and our, our, our connections to our, the ambassadors and the missions in Geneva, Geneva is an extremely important place for us, of course, because it's, as you said, it's, uh, you know, as it was said, it was, it's the engine room for, for, for so many things that happen. And so all these conversations about permits, uh, about how we can organize this, is happening here. And, uh, and, and so we are very fortunate, and I also think why this is one of the reasons why Switzerland is so well placed to, to, do, to do this, to become a unifier in, in a sense, uh, to help the process along, because we have this access. And so, I mean, these are, these are the two main things. First of all, we, there's a lot of technology involved, we'll go into, but there's really a, a, a sampling permission which requires the, the buy-in, the ownership of the, the, each, each country, which is, and this is very important to emphasize, it's their corals, it's their coast. It's also their risk and, and, and loss really directly if they die, these corals. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's the answer. And I'm very happy also as a researcher that you emphasize the hard and heavy work that it involves, all the sweat, not just not just for the heat, but also the real work behind it. Um, and I think what you point out also with the, the open source and the open access um, is, is so crucial to uh, build on the trust building processes. So can you perhaps share your reflections of what happens once you have the analysis? What, how do you go about building trust in the regions with the data you will have. So in, in our particular case, we have another uh, big advantage uh, of being uh, in, the, in the federal system in Switzerland. We have something called the Swiss Data Science Center, which is a new institution between ETHZ uh, in the Zurich and, and EPFL. And this is, is, a, is a hub for, for, uh, for the latest in, in, in computer, uh, uh, what do you call it, computer science, machine learning, AI tools, etc., and all the data we, can, we will obtain will all be funneled through the Swiss Data Science Center. And be, first of all, the raw data will be completely and openly available to everybody, but the raw data in themselves are not, you know, you have to be positioned to be able to use them uh, immediately. So we, are, we, will, we will, A, make the raw data available, and B, working directly with the local scientists as we extract the real information from these raw data, we will, they will be included. So there's no hiding from anybody what, what the corals say. Are they going to survive three degrees or five degrees in this region? Are they under pressure here or not? No, it's going to be available. And so this is, this is a, actually a, a, a distinct departure, I may say directly, from current practices, certainly, I mean, in fact, globally, but certainly in the Red Sea. And, and this is, of course, for, for, for us, this is an absolute prerequisite for creating the trust and the open dialogue because if we begin to, to hide these data and these observations in, on this part of the reef, uh, reef and from that part of the reef, then we cannot expect people to come open-mindedly and, and, and have a, a, a clean discussion about it. So I think open science is, 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 uh, is I mean, yeah, we have to do it. There's no escape from that. I'm, I'm going to put a question to all three of you and also want to take the opportunity to bring, bring you in, Alex. Um, in 
in a lot of scientific innovations, there is this challenge between uh, speed and scale. Uh, in terms of the speed in which new, new uh, evolutions or even the degradation of the environment comes along, and the scale at which you need to find a solution to, to, to the problem. Now, you've been working now for many years on science diplomacy. How have you seen in other fields um, that have grappled with the inherent challenge of speed and scale uh, that is at the heart of science diplomacy? It's a tricky question um, because there is an inherent uh, tension in diplomacy uh, between what you say, speed and scale, which are necessary and we need uh, speed and scale, and the ways and means how the international community comes together and forms a shared sense of purpose. When you say speed and scale, I hear efficiency, um, a, a concept that we know well from, from the economic field. Now, diplomacy is inefficient. Right? Human relations are inefficient. Love is in inefficient. So um, I always uh, argue that we, although the imperative is a speed and scale, we must have the stamina to take the time and, and quietly and determinedly work on what we have to work in order to attain a level where then we can go into speed and scale. If we start with that, uh, then I fear that we will feel overwhelmed and powerless. So let's take it, so speed, scale, but also Let's take it sequentially. Let's build the science cooperation first and take it from there. So no Formula One acceleration, but rather a, a, a slower acceleration, but more sustainable. It, so the, the, we need to accelerate the capacity of the international community to take in scientific insight into, for its own decision making. But for that, we need to be able to produce that science. In this point of scale, th that's where we are at. We need to bring all the coastline states of the Red Sea onto this platform. And that's, that's the starting point. There is no acceleration without that. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm pressing on speed and scale because essentially this is the result of the IPCC study from, from, from February. No, if we don't speed up, uh, then uh, we, we will never catch up. So if, if I see your pictures and you, the, the data you presented from, from the Great Barrier Reef, uh, how, how, do, how as a scientist you, you deal with this dilemma that Alexandre mentioned on speed and scale? Well, it's, it's, a, it's very much a question of scale because this is what is killing the corals in the Great Barrier Reef and many other places is a global warming. So you cannot get a bigger scale than that and you cannot get more inertia you know, in, 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 the, in the process than, than that. Even if we stop all our green CO2 emissions today, the temperature is going to keep going up for a couple hundred years. Huh? Just to be clear about that. Because it's simply you could, there's an inertia in, in, in the system. And so uh, the, 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 the brutal truth is that many of, you just speak about the coral reefs now, many of the coral reefs are they're condemned. You know, they, they will, they, with the exception of a few pockets here and there, they will not be able to withstand two, three degrees at the end of the century. It's simply not possible. Now, um, you know, I think uh, uh, this, this is why, so we, we can watch this, and, and of course, scientists, we can react faster. You know, it's, it's, in contrast probably to the diplomatic world and, and the governmental world, et cetera, we, we, are, we can react much faster and we see things much faster. Everything happens, there's a much faster turnover. We have known, for example, for now for almost a decade, a little less, that these corals in the Red Sea are so resistant. Then, then we have quantified better and better and refined that conclusion. But, you know, by and large, we have known this for at least eight, nine years now. But before we assemble all the parts that have to come together to generate the transnational Red Sea Center, generate the partnership with the foreign ministry, generate the dialogues that we are beginning to have, I mean, it takes time. So there's just a reality. This is another part of what I call the reality is that there is a time scale of, of that. 
And but so I think this is we we, we have to arm ourselves with both ambition to go as fast as we can in the case of, of the Red Sea to protect these corals, but also with a certain patience because if we don't bring, again, we cannot escape the regional aspect of this. We have to do this on a regional scale. And I should say, uh, Fasel, if we, if we don't bring all the actors together in, on a broad front, then we are we are not just not gonna go uh, where, because it only takes one or two countries who do not follow, who do not protect, but do the opposite to destroy this, this ecosystem. Now, from from a, a regional perspective, the the Middle East is, of course, a great also a great zone of continuities. Now, um, it's there is change, but there is also a lot of continuities there in terms of the the political systems, uh, ideas of uh, of of long term culture. But how from speed in the Middle East is something very different than it might be in uh, in, uh, in 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 a multilateral capital like like Geneva. Um, how do you deal with speed and scale uh, in, in a regional context? Well, I'm a person that totally believes in uh, if you have the data, if you have the research, then you should act. But that's me. It does not happen um, on issues that require everyone on board, not only uh, countries, but also different stakeholders. So it cannot be the case. Um, and it's a process a long process um, and being realistic about it. Why do I say that? I mean, for a long time, the whole world has known that climate change is, is affecting us all. But just now, are people getting more aware and do uh, uh, politicians and decision makers getting more aware that we must act immediately? But still, it's not like, uh, it can't be speedy, and it has to be small steps that are taken. And this is something we learned as an organization, dealing with things on ground. So I must, Yanni, I must say, um, and you might all find it very surprising, that we've been working on calling on the rehabilitation of the Jordan River for the past 20 years. And we still see a polluted river, um, a, a trickle, actually, of the river, but we're not going to give up because we will keep building one step on the other. I have many different approaches that we are working on from allowing ourselves to work with the uh, local communities on developing small projects to do with um, the proper infrastructure of water, of energy that they need. But this all builds up and will affect the river itself, you know, as a water body. It will all end up having that regional aspect of cooperation. So it's it's something that you have, to, and especially in, in requiring so many countries to come together, you have to build small steps. You have to look and seize the opportunity when it's the right time to be able to um, to address a certain aspect and move forward with it. Thank you. I, I'm just going to pinpoint already to you that you should get your, get your I'm sure you're burning to ask questions, so get those ready. But I would like to, to, to inquire, have one inquiry to, to you, um, Anders and Jana. Um, there is the, the ambition, the long-term ambition to have, of course, regional cooperation around an environmental protection. This is a long-term co cooperative approach, but there are also some really huge imminent risks which are there. Uh, just the safer tanker, for instance. So is, that is a, a hundred, one million dollars of barrels of oil that are in a, in a ship in front of the port of Hodeida that is about to break up. And that possibly, if that happens, um, that, that would be a huge natural disaster. So in, in terms of the immediate needs for environmental protection and the longer term diplomatic framings for environmental cooperation, is there also an entry point for science diplomacy? Because I'm sure the evidence base of an environmental disaster of the SAFER is pretty bleak. But so in terms of energizing this, the speed of collaboration, that might be uh, just something to, to, to reflect on. I mean, uh, for the safer, you probably all know this is this, uh, it's, it's an oil tanker that served as like an oil terminal off the, the, the coast of Yemen. 
it's been sitting since the conflict bro broke out unmaintained. It's, it's rusting away and it, it has 1.14 million barrels of oil on it, which is four times the uh, Val Exxon Valdez disaster. If this thing blows, I, I mean, I don't want to think about that. And I don't think uh, Saudi Arabia, for example, want to think about that because what science can contribute very concretely in that situation is a clear analysis of where this oil will go and how fast. And so we know precisely, and this changes, by the way, seasonally. In the, in the summer, the current is one way, in the winter is the other way. We know precisely how fast this will be transported and how big the destruction will be, and there will be no you know, defense against it, essentially. So I think in that ca particular case, it's a very concrete threat. You know, we can contribute to the science. We know precisely what's going to happen. You really need to deal with this now. And, and fortunately, by the way, I hear now that there is a progress on that front. Uh, the UN has negotiated that there will be access to the ship if the money can be found, and the oil will be hopefully point, pumped out uh, before, uh, before it really leaks. But, but so in that case, you know, it's very concrete. Science is, is, is right there, you know, uh, informing about the, the, uh, the consequences. So once you have invested into the Red Call project, there are 140 million dollars that that are needed to pump down to to reduce the risk of the oil 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 disaster, which is nothing against the loss we will suffer if this thing breaks. It will be a very small peanut of investment. <laughs> That's a very obvious risk, and um, Anders uh, correctly mentioned how science is there uh, and how we need to act immediately. Um, but there are many other risks, many, that we do not even think about because we feel like they're um, negligible in that sense. But an oil um, coming from a project that is being proposed between uh, uh, the Emirates through Saudi Jordan and, and then to Israel, this could be a huge disaster if we don't actually uh, uh, look at it carefully uh, uh, study it on a regional scale and take the proper measures to be dealing with it. Plastic pollution is a risk to the Red Sea that we should. So we should never forget that there are many risks, but we need to take action on all, try to take action on all those risks. Nothing is um, in our power basically to, um, if it's going to happen at some point, it's going to happen, but we try to keep working on trying to mitigate those risks. Alex, please, you also wanted to come in on this. Uh, <clears throat> Achim, I, you use two concepts that are related but distinct, speed and urgency. Mm -hmm. Because the situation is urgent, we need to do something very quickly. Uh, and it's urgent be because we have done nothing uh, possibly because we haven't really taken notice, uh, uh, haven't realized what happens, or looked the other way, and so on and so forth. That's where, in our thinking, the acceleration comes from, from the anticipation. If you are aware what is going to happen, then you are in this iterative process of realizing where the urgency is, and then you are ready to act. So, anticipation leads to acceleration, which gives speed in order to respond to urgency. If you wait and have not anticipated, then you're always too slow. Thank you. So, we have now uh, a good 15, 20 minutes for, uh, for questions, answers, comments, ladies and gentlemen. I would also like to bring in, of course, our viewers online uh, who can participate uh, of also asking questions or, or send comments. We, we have my colleague Lena, who is uh, following the, 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 the chat online. Um, Any one who would like to come in with, with a, a question or ob observation? And now I should put on my glasses because I don't see I don't see you. Are there any students from the Graduate Institute in the room? We have a question from. We have a question. Sorry, you see <laughs> my, my glasses. I didn't quite see you right there. You didn't there. see me. <laughs> well, no, welcome, um, Yvette. Yes. No, I will start by thanking the presenters on bringing this real example as to where science and diplomacy could could come together. 
And I think the whole question of looking at regional stability, because that's the thing that we're not talking about eno enough about when we talk about climate change. And I'm so happy that this gives an example where addressing climate change would address, would, would address the whole question of, um, of stability, of um, peace and stability. But my question is this, is that we have seen how these, um, how, okay, this is a good step now that we are bringing science, linking science with diplomacy. But we know that the final end, the, those who should take action, those who should take the action, if they do not take the action, then all the good work is lost. And we come to, we talk about prevention, and I think this is, is, it's a priority of the Secretary General, prevention. But we see that do we do, is enough done, even when we have all the, all the, all the information. We see now for the IPCC, there are some, some people in authority who are questioning the science. So how do you see, how can we, we work together to make sure that whatever needs to be done to prevent a situation of peace, um, breach of peace and security, to have regional stability, how do we get, make sure that the people who should take action listen? A, a recent resolution to talk about climate change and peace and security in the Security Council did not go through. Yeah, I already gave <laughs> thank, thank you, and thanks for the <coughs> panelists for, for a great discussion. I, I would like to add, actually, um, how do you bring in those decision makers that don't want to believe in certain scientific facts, um, be this about global warming or other, other issues? How can you convince them that it's nevertheless an important thing to, to listen to scientists, because I think the pandemic has shown there were huge debates, scientific debates also. It's enough that one person, one, one professor disagrees, and then you have a whole set of people who say, look, he's a professor, he says the opposite, why should I believe um, scientists? So how do you bring those people on board of, of these issues? And maybe one point to the, to the oil tanker, oil tanker um, Maybe just tweet and tag Elon Musk and that you need you need the money because that's that's the way things are done <laughs> done today, I, I think. Maybe he jumps on, on it. Um but but also in, in, in all seriousness, it's it's fascinating to hear that a country like Saudi Arabia that is swimming in money now with the with the current oil price is is not willing to 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 do more and quicker and is maybe waiting for somebody to step in. So how do you bring on board those those governments in the end. And do please introduce yourself who you are. So I'm Richard Lucas and I'm at the World Economic Forum. There was a, yes, please. Hello. Thank you very much. I'm Omar Sharif from uh, Permanent Mission of Sudan. Uh, thank you for uh, the presentation. I, I would like uh, my question to Mr. Andreas. Andreas. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the threat to, to the environment in the Red Sea over fishing and pollution and climate change. Um, I know from a governmental point of view, if I say it, that uh, something uh, it can be uh, through the governmental policies, it can be addressed, like pollution and overfishing. Uh, regarding the issue of the climate, uh, climate change, it is a very global issue. And these things, uh, 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 lead us that this is a global issue and it should be action from the international. In Sudan, we have experience, uh, not uh, only uh, for, with private person, also for organization, and also in some regional organization like uh, Bersiga. Um, for example, if we return back, uh, uh, I can mention Mr. Uh, Mr. Hans Haas, this is a very famous uh, person in the marine, uh, like marine ecologist who produces the first uh, documentary film about uh, Red Sea of Sudan, I think 1951. 
So we have experience and the push to, 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 to work with the uh, organization and uh, who are wishing to, to help the government of Sudan uh, to protect the environment. And my question, uh, what is your approach to working in the global, global, global setting? to address this issue related only to the Red Sea and coral reef and Red Sea. Uh, other question related because uh, there is another uh, work, uh, scientific work done in the same area through Bersiga and other institutions. And uh, I think this is the beginning of the uh, 20s. So uh, did you return back about to this research to make compa compa comparison between what what happened about uh, after this after ten years, for example? Thank you very much. There was one uh, question still up in the top top left. Yes, please, and then we're going to get back to to our panelists. And Th thank you very second. much, um, Ambassador Hassan of Djibouti. Uh, I would like to start by thanking the EPFL uh, for the briefing and the presentation. I'm sorry I missed the, the first, I think, some of your presentation, but uh, I think I have a good understanding of, of uh, where you were heading with the presentation. Uh, I just wanted maybe to start by um, uh, thanking the EPFL for, for, for drawing our attention on, on issues such issue that is important um, and understand, I, I, I would like to understand a little bit better. Um, I was quite uh, happy to see uh, the, um, the comment he made about the, the, the open science um, part of, of the presentation. I think it's something as Djibouti we, we look forward to. Um, and I wanted to understand also um, I think you mentioned f for f uh, you mentioned it because you you said about it's about trust, which is true. But I think it's also about um, having uh, uh, access to um, an information and maybe being part of of uh, uh, um, creating that science so it can um, uh, strengthen and foster. Um, a greater ownership of, of uh, the preservation that we are we are trying to, as I understand it, uh, we are trying to uh, to look after when we want to uh, when we are looking at the Red Red Sea corals. So this is something that we we see very positively. But the, uh, I was quite uh, find it interesting uh, the conversation about uh, speed, uh, urgency, uh, scale but particularly speed and urgency, uh, particularly in the region where we are, uh, where uh, when we have competing urgencies, if I may put it that way. Uh, so um, ca uh, capturing the attention of governments, I think, um, uh, to, to, uh, to consider Red Sea Coral's preservation also as one of the uh, um, urgencies of the moment, I think it's something that need uh, collective uh, effort. And I think we will, uh, as an ambassador here, I will, uh, I just want to pledge that we will do our part to uh, to pledge for that um, and, and to see how we could, we could, we could assist your, your, uh, your, up, your, your undertaking. Um, and finally, um, I would, I would, I would say that, uh, uh, and maybe th that would be my question. Do you, uh, I, I saw that on the presentation when you mentioned something about the partners and you, uh, you indicated, uh, Mr. Um, Maybaum, that there were uh, regional research centers. Uh, do you have any in the Horn of Africa uh, uh, where Djibouti belongs to that you, you are in contact with? Or how do you intend to involve the, the scientists of, of our countries, basically? Thank you. Just hold on, because there was, there was two more which come up, and then we come back to you, and then I have a final question to you at the very end. Please, uh, thank you for being patient.
Thank you very much. My name is Hassan Tuya. I'm uh, from the Swiss Foreign Ministry from the Middle East and North Africa Division. Uh, I was interested by your uh, discussion about scaling up and, uh, and speeds, and I was wondering about ways of scaling up in terms of uh, making more data available and sharing data with other universities also outside this region. Uh, so there's scaling up in terms of buying more hardware, boats, and stuff to, uh, to conduct more research in the Red Sea, which is completely necessary, I understand that. But I also read that in Australia they're conducting interesting research, uh, also using AI to figure out where um, climate-resistant breeds of coral might be found. So I was, I was wondering if there are synergies or things that can be put together in terms of, terms of data uh, so that other scientists elsewhere can make sense uh, of this data, or indeed maybe AI algorithm, whatever, can use this data to, uh, uh, to find answers. Thank you. I think, David, you had your hand up, or was it a wave? No? Okay, good. So, back to you. I, we maybe start maybe, you, maybe right? I, I will start answering all the questions I can remember. No, <laughs> there's another... You're pointing. There's another question. Or? Was was there another question? Okay. Then let let's take it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Anna Grishting. I'm an architect and urban planner, also working on environmental peace building. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, I'm also interested in. Uh, you talked about obviously the relation with your research and policy. Um, but also um, on, if we're looking towards the future, on maybe spatial planning, regional planning. Um, as we know, there are all the shipping lines that come through. Um, and uh, to understand better, you know, is the idea also to designate, for example, p protected areas, transboundary protected areas. And um, also, I think the desalination is also having an adverse effect, at least, I mean, I know the Arabian or Persian Gulf better, but um, so, you know, how in the future we're also going to um, develop all this infrastructure that's necessary for water and uh, all the other infrastructures we need, um, but also how your research can inform uh, the planners and the spatial planners, regional planners, etc. Okay. <laughs> uh, we would never go into the field without working directly with local scientists. And that's just exactly what we've been doing. And we're starting and we're doing it. There is no point. This is not in our interest at all. So this is very, very important that we are in direct contact, which we are uh, on a daily basis, with the local scientists. It's important for the planning. It's extremely important because it's pragmatically because the local scientists, the local rain, uh, park rangers and managers, etc., they know their reef in a way that we never will. So there's no way of working there in this region without directly linking up and physically presence on the ships, sweating together, <laughs> working together on this. This is very clear. And this is, I, I, they want to be very clear about this. It's a very direct collaboration that happens. Now, um, with regard to, 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 to the global issue of global warming versus the Red Sea, you know, we, we, we are not pretending that we can do anything as a, a transnational Red Sea Center about global warming. We cannot. Uh, this is another game, it's another scale <laughs> a pro a problem. But the, the reason why we're so focused on the Red Sea is that there we know we have corals that actually can withstand the projected trajectories which are, as I said before, so it's going to, they're going to cause, this heating is going to cause a lot of other problems that we already see that, you know, today. But those corals in the Red Sea have this unique capability. And that's why we have, we have we have, that's where our focus is right now. Now, when it comes to uh, integrating uh, knowledge from, uh, from other parts of, notably the, the Australian scientists, uh, top-notch scientists, there are many of them there in France, they're in the US, there, there are many scientists. We are in constant, con you know, they, these are our colleagues, we're in constant uh, talk with them. The scientific packages that I showed you here are integrating all of this cutting edge knowledge. So there's no, there's absolutely no doubt that this is extremely valuable. And as we progress and science moves all the time, technologies move all the time, we are grabbing this immediately and we're incorporating it. So, so in terms of, of uh, I mean, yeah, we don't want to go into technical detail, but, but this is clearly, you know, these are our colleagues, we talk to them 
at, our, at the conferences, we have phone calls, we have Zoom meetings with them on a constant basis. So that is already, you know, clearly integrated in the efforts. It, this is the nature of, of, of science, basically. Now, the question, can you, would you please repeat the question from up there? It was about, what was it? I forget. Maybe I shouldn't answer all the questions, by the way. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to? Yeah, please, please do. Yeah. So um, there was that question of how do we have uh, policymakers um, who should be taking action um, actually doing something about it? Um, so I'll give an example of what we do as an organization. There's definitely skepticism. And so science and research is not enough to convince them to take action. But the way we do it is depending on the situation, involving the people is such a powerful tool. But raising the awareness and educating the people on ground, they are the ones that are able to put that pressure on the policymakers to take action. And it's worked for us, and it was the only way to move things forward, to get the government and the cabinet in Jordan to recognize and place um, the Jordan River rehabilitation as a national priority, and have the ministries form together a committee to look into that um, uh, issue and to be dealing on a, a regional level with the Israelis and Palestinians. So it's really important to, uh, uh, to engage the people and educate them. But there are, it's also important to create champions that are willing to help on that, um, on that level. Because there are people um, um, as decision makers that do believe and they can help with that process. But also on the international level. So a lot of our work was possible because of the international support that we got. Um, for example, um, in late 2020, we repackaged the programmings we were working on uh, to address climate change and climate change resilience. So we produced a report calling um, on uh, a green blue deal for, mid for the Middle East. One of the components was uh, a water energy nexus for the region and the trade of between water and renewable energy between our three countries. And it was championed by the foreign minister of Finland. He believed and he facilitated and he helped bring on um, uh, uh, our governments, um, uh, our decision makers. Um, but also depending on the situation, we have to really be strategizing. So bringing in the private sector, and showing the economic benefits of such projects on ground can help facilitate and move it forward. And this is how we saw the recent letter of intent that was signed between Jordan and Israel um, and the UAE, uh, because it was driven, of course, it was our vision, our pre-feasibility studies uh, as an organization, believing in building healthy interdependencies and understanding for many years, and this is another issue of um, um, uh, urgency and, and scale, basically, but it was all there, but it, again, being realistic and knowing when it will happen. Um, so bringing in the private sector made it all possible. And now we see that um, uh, uh, this agreement for uh, exchange of water and energy in our region is possible. Alex, I also wanted to bring you in. The navigating competing urgencies, as the ambassador of Djibouti mentioned, that's, that's your day job, also, among other things. Yes, but you always have to, to begin somewhere. Yeah. And uh, I would like also to, to reply or offer a response to Ambassador Stevens' question and, and uh, uh, Richard Lukas. Um, imagine if we manage to bring all the countries together that share the coastline of the Red Sea to cooperate and to congregate on that project by giving the necessary um, authorizations and by encouraging their scientists to come onto the platform and cooperate. If we manage that, then the scientific work can happen. 
Through that, we create a new reality, what I call an espace de vécu commun. They come together, they create something together. It's not science, then, that is imposed from outside on them, but they have created it themselves through their scientists in cooperation with all the scientists of the region. And so they will, may well be inclined uh, to believe it, because it's their own science. And they will have experienced on that common platform this shared sense of purpose and ambition, which may then facilitate actual political decisions that then go towards uh, protecting and making the arbitrages uh, they, they need to do in, in order to take decisions. So this co-creation, and this comes to my, comes to my last, last question to you before, before we come to the conclusion of this event. In this process of co-creation, what are your expectations in Geneva, in this place where you are, in, the, in this uh, science diplomacy space, but beyond that, also in the peace place in Geneva, in the, in the social science place in Geneva? Um, very briefly, what are your expectations? Well, I think, uh, as I said, I think Geneva is, 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 makes this, our project, our particular project, possible. And uh, it, it creates a, a platform for, for dialogue that is uh, almost unique in the world. And so we are extremely well positioned to, to, to create this dialogue. I think it's one thing about science and scientific data. There was a question about what do you do with the people who don't believe in science. Well, there are some not, you know, very famous examples of this, and, and some of them are lost cases, let's be honest. But, but in fact, most people do. There's a, there's a very strong basis of rationality in the system in, in general. I think what, what in, in any case, what, if you, that whether you believe in, in, in CO2 or not, uh, well, it's there. But it, there's, if, whether you like biodiversity or, or, or respect uh, you know, the environment or you don't care, there's one thing that everybody will agree on, mostly, is that there's monetary value in these ecosystems and these resources. And so there's an enormous potential for loss. It comes to your question about, about the developments uh, you know, in the Red Sea. There are major uh, social economic developments on the way, especially on the Saudi Arabian coast. They're obviously going to have an impact. This is a two-edged sword. On one hand, you want investments. You cannot, we're not advocating that we should stop everything. It has to be done, by the way, trans, transnational uh, protected areas, sure, is, is, is one part of the equation. But we cannot stop reality. You know, there's, there's a reality out there. But, you know, the, 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 on, the, on the other hand, if the governments that are investing trillions of dollars in some cases lose the very foundation upon which that they make these, these investments, which are healthy ecosystems in this case, ah, this, you don't have to be particularly smart to understand that argument, right? So, so I, there, is, there, is, there is a very strong impetus in the system, simply from a financial perspective, that we have to, we have to do something. Now, what do we, I, I, Geneva, I think Geneva, as I said, is, is just a fantastic hub. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonder of, of diplomacy. It's, it's, it's in the middle of Europe. We are connected to the scientific communities. CERN has been, uh, since the Second World War, a major engine. Now we have JESTA. <laughs> It's, it's, that's to me is, is a, an extremely positive development that is keep pumping energy in the right direction, uniting the different forces that have to be united. And so for me, Geneva is, uh, apart from the weather, it's a wonderful place. In, the, in the, some part of the year, today it's not bad. No. Jana, please, what are the expectations you, you would articulate? Well, I think, first of all, this is a wonderful initiative. And I think it's so important. And I think that we will definitely cooperate on, uh, on the lessons learned. Um, I see Geneva as the right platform to make it all happen. We will need a lot of work to build that trust among regional partners. And I think it will all be done through that diplomacy work and having, you know, um, um, Geneva involved directly to facilitate. It will definitely make all the difference. And this is based on, you know, um, uh, examples of our work on ground, how it can really do wonders. Um, this is a new hope, um, but much needed hope um, for the region, um, but for the entire world. 
I see because it will affect us all. Alexandre. What we are entitled to expect from Geneva and what Geneva provides is what I call vertical integration between the big global questions we are discussing here. Uh, climate change. Uh, uh, let's remind ourselves the IPCC is located in Geneva. Uh, between the global conversation we are having here and the actual situation on the ground or underwater. And those two situations, they are conditioning one another. We learn about the necessities to act against climate change through that debate. But what is happening underground, the research in this project, will come and feed the global conversations we have because it will produce insight which can be used in other contexts. So it's important to always link our diplomatic world here, the world's foremost center of global governance, with the real world on the ground. That project does it through the mediation of International Geneva. And what, thank you for these words, and what this project then therefore also shows is that there is no space for fatalism or cynicism. That there are ways of working to deal with the big global challenges which we have in front of us. Um, here we had one example where we deconstruct something extremely practical onto a regional level and where there is a lot of experience on the ground to make these type of complex initiatives work. And there are many examples of that nature and they have worked and these are long-term processes. And I think the, the comparative advantage of, of locating, having Geneva as part of that project is absolutely necessary as much as it is to, to be as grounded as possible. With these words, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to conclude this event. I'd like to thank, uh, of course, uh, Jana, Anders, and Alexandre for, for, your, for your time and your, 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 your wisdom. I'd like to thank all of you. I'd like to thank the partners, the Diplomatic Club and EPFL, and, uh, for which we gladly collaborated here. And I'd like also to, to note that there is a private cocktail reception now with members and guests of the Diplomatic Club, the Red Sea Center, and the Geneva Graduate Institute. Thank you very much for making time this evening and uh, glad to continue the conversation over a drink now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.